Since becoming pastor, I've taught from this same passage in Acts chapter 2, the start of each year. And I usually start the message by making everyone laugh. I have lots of stories about people in church who demand their own way and their time and their preferences and you get mad over silly things. I like to make you laugh. It's a great way to start the year. And I wrote a hilarious introduction to this message. It was creative and fun and funny and you would have loved it. But when I finished all my writing, I, I kind of had a pit in my stomach and although I knew the intro was great, I sensed the Lord wanted me to say something else. So I'm determined to be obedient. I'm gonna start this year on a very serious note and you'll hear my funny introduction next year. I saved it, so it's, it's great and you'll remember then that it's, it's been seasoned. I wanna to talk to you about something that I see way too often. Church hurts. A few months ago, I met a couple in the guest center after church and I, I asked my usual question, said, so how did you happen to come to First NLR? What brings you here? And she wouldn't look me in the eye. Finally, she said, my husband thinks we should give church a try again. I'm here, but I'm not sure you'll see me again. I don't know if I believe any of this. I sat there quiet. I've learned that often the best answer is, is to keep listening. And after a while, she said, uh, I was hurt in church when I was young, and I've never been back. My heart broke for her. And my only answer was, I'm sorry. I wish her story was rare, but it's not. I regularly meet people who are skeptical about church and religion, not because they don't believe God, but because they've been hurt in his church. I met another family who'd been attending our church for three years, but had never introduced themselves to me. And when they told me that, I said, well, why? And their reply was, we come in a couple moments after service starts, and we leave as soon as it's over. We've avoided getting involved or getting to know people. We didn't want to meet you because we were afraid you'd push us to get involved. We were really hurt in our last church, and we're afraid it's going to happen again. We know we should be in church. We know we need it. We're just scared. I met another guy who told me, I sat down and introduced myself. He said, oh, I know who you are. I've watched you for years, but I wasn't sure I wanted to meet you. I just don't want to be let down by another pastor. Now, are some of them oversensitive? Probably. Can I was hurt be an excuse to be lazy? I'm sure it can. There are certainly times people have held the church responsible for their own faults and failures. But I can't ignore the fact that many of the hurts are real, are deep, and result in a lack of trust in God and his church. My heart breaks. When what is supposed to be a safe place instead becomes a place of hurt and pain, it can take years to trust again. It's a big step just to walk in a church, let alone connect in a deeper way. You've been hurt once or twice, and you don't want to risk being hurt again. I get that. I can't unwind all the situations in your past. I don't have the answers for everything that happened. But what I can say is, if you've been hurt in church, I'm sorry. And if you've been hurt in this church, I'm sorry. My heart hurts to think I or another member of this church caused you pain. Please forgive me. Please forgive us. And please give God's church another chance. God's people aren't perfect. We make mistakes. We say and do things that we shouldn't. And there are some people in church who aren't God's people. By their words and actions, they make it obvious they don't follow Jesus. And I want to caution you, don't let people who aren't God's people keep you from God's church. And if you've been hurt in church, I want you to know the reason why I preach this message every year is for you. I love church. 
I love coming to church. I love you. Even with all its challenges and flaws, I'm still convinced the church is God's plan to reach our world. And I'm still convinced church is the best place for you to be a lifelong follower of Jesus. So let's, let's see if we can't connect and reconnect together. And if you've stayed away and you've been hesitant, would you meet me halfway? And let's just try and see if maybe together we can be healthy. God created the church. It belongs to him. With that thought in mind, our goal must be to become the church God created, to please him in who we are and what we do. So your quest and mine should be for a biblically functioning community, a healthy church that fulfills the purposes of a church as laid out in scripture. Our purpose is to create lifelong followers of Jesus. My dream and God's desire for First NLR is that we be a healthy church. How many people will attend here is not my dream. How cool and trendy is our building? Not my dream. How much money comes in? That's not my dream. My dream is a healthy church. A church that facilitates personal transformation as a result of the life-altering power of Jesus. My prayer is that in a healthy church, your hurts can be healed and you can rediscover the joy of being a part of a church family. So what does a healthy church look like? For the answer to that, I want to take you to the first church in the book of Acts. Jesus told the disciples to wait in the upper room just before he ascended to heaven. They waited and they received the Holy Spirit. And they came out of that room ready to reach people with the gospel and the church was born. They quickly became the biblical picture of a healthy church functioning as God designed and intended. And so looking at this passage at the first church, we can identify 12 signs of a healthy growing church. If we're healthy, these 12 signs will be evident in our church body. If, if you're new to First NLR, this is important for you to hear. We desire to be a healthy, balanced church. We want all 12 of these signs to be evident in our church. This is who we are. This is what we're about. If you're just checking us out, you picked a great day to be here. This will give you the full picture. This is it. This is who we want to be, what we want to do. If this is your 17th time to hear this, congratulations. You probably could come up and preach it. And you still need to be reminded how important it is. Because you are either a part of making our church sick or keeping our church healthy. We pick it up in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And there's the first sign. A healthy church is a learning church. Every week we're committed to learning from God's word. My goal is that you can apply something you learn. That what you learn will make a difference in your life on Tuesday. Uh, I, I don't preach a lot of catchy sermons on the latest hot topics. There are a lot of guys who do that better than me. If you're looking for a talk on pop culture or you want somebody who will address politics, this is not your place. We are just going to keep opening God's word together. That's one of our core values. The Bible is our guidebook for living. That means you got to read it. You need to know what it says and what it means. You need to know the commands of scripture and how to apply them to your life. We will always focus on scripture and we will refuse to avoid the commands of Jesus that might make us uncomfortable. We will open God's word and see what it has to say. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. So they're not only devoted to teaching. The Bible says fellowship. That's an old word. means spending time together, having dinner, having a party, connecting in relationships. This is about a family being together and loving each other. A healthy church is a loving church. Christian journey is not designed to be walked alone. As we continue to grow as a church, we have to be very intentional about fellowship, about developing relationships with others. That's one reason I push you to get involved in a ministry or a connection class or a small group or a prayer group because that's where you build relationships. We must be a healthy church who loves each other and we must build healthy families. We want to equip you 
to be a healthy, loving family who follows Jesus together. There's a lot in our society that fights against healthy families. The attempts to redefine healthy family and healthy sexuality and relationships are frightening. The statistics are alarming. We must continue to build our families according to God's word and its unchanging principles. So your kids study the same things we study every week because our goal is to facilitate spiritual conversations in your home. So on the way home and during the week, you can talk about the same things. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. A healthy church is a praying church. Prayer is a dynamic, ongoing, intimate conversation with God. It's God, the creator of the universe, to design prayer as a method for us to connect to him. It's one of our core values. We connect with God through worship and prayer. And my prayer is every week in every one of our services, everyone connects with God and that on a regular basis, you find a time and a place to connect with God. Life gets busy and the stress and the pressures can crowd out things that matter the most. And so I challenge you to spend time with God every day in worship or reading your Bible, prayer. If you spend daily time with God, you will develop a deep personal connection to God. And that connection to him will give you a greater sense of peace, even in life's storms. Verse 43 says, everyone was filled with awe. Filled with awe. So they weren't talking about how wonderful they were. They were talking about how wonderful God is. They were filled with awe at what God was doing and that he was using them. A healthy church is humble. Humility is about gratefulness. God will bring growth to a humble church that acknowledges him as the builder and the owner. On the other hand, God will let a proud church fail. So I, I walk and pray in the sanctuary, and one of the prayers I often pray is, God, this is your church. Show us your way. Thank you, God, for allowing me to lead your church for this period of time. But God, this is not our church. This is not my church. This is your church. Everything we have comes from you. Everything we have belongs to you. I'm in awe of what you do through us. Now, did you, I hope you heard what I said. This is not my church. It doesn't matter what I want. We do a lot of things I don't want to do. We sing songs I don't like. This is not your church. It doesn't matter what you want. People get upset at me. They'll come and say, well, I think. I say, I don't care what you think. If we do what you think, we're in trouble. If we just do what I think, we're in trouble. The goal is not to make a person happy. This is God's church. And so we want to follow God's will and God's plan for God's church. If we follow my plan or your plan, we're in trouble. Right? You clap now until you want it your way. A healthy church, number five, is supernatural. Supernatural is when God does something we can't do, a miracle. When a drug addict, a sex addict, a control freak, or an alcoholic is set free, that's a miracle. That's supernatural. Uh, you need, if you say, well, I just haven't seen miracles, you need to come any Tuesday night to celebrate recovery and just see all the things God's doing. Come on, chip night. And uh, on chip night, you can watch miracles walk down the aisle to the front. When a sick body is healed, that's a miracle. That's supernatural. When a marriage is restored, that's a miracle. That's supernatural. When someone considering suicide decides and said to live for Jesus, that's supernatural. When a person with a bad attitude gets a good attitude, how many know that's a miracle? I mean, only God. That's supernatural. When a greedy person becomes a giving person, that's supernatural. When someone who's been trapped in a cycle of depression finds joy, that's supernatural. When a destructive gossip becomes an encouraging friend, that's a miracle. And when a sinner accepts Jesus, that's the greatest miracle of all. That's supernatural. It's awesome to see the different ways God works in the different services. Across our campuses, we have more than 20 services every week. No two services are the same. 
That's not just our planning. That's God working through what's called the gifts of the Spirit. And almost every week, the gifts of prophecy and word of knowledge are in op operation. That's why the message, the response, often even the worship are different from service to service. We've had powerful moments when God's spoken to us in a supernatural way. And you say, well, Pastor Rod, why don't you tell us when that happens? Why don't you say, thus saith the Lord, like they did in church when I was growing up? Well, for several reasons. First, I don't use the word saith very often, and so it's, that's odd. But I, here's, the, here's my approach. I shouldn't have to announce when God's working, when the gifts are the spirit in operation. The spiritually mature sense and know it, and what God is saying is confirmed in your heart and in your spirit. Those who aren't spiritually mature may not recognize why. They just know their needs are being met. And they ask things like, well, why am I crying? Well, you're sensing God and his spirit working in your heart. You say, well, Pastor Rod, I don't see when the music's different. That's because the guys who run the lyrics computer are amazing. And they move so fast and switch so fast, you think something unplanned was planned. But God puts things together. God's supernatural power is in response to our collective hunger. If you want to see more of God's power at work, get hungry. Start praying for it. Start expecting it. Notice something else in this passage. Signs and wonders weren't exclusive to the ministry of one guy or two guys. Instead, everyone was involved in ministry. Everyone was seeing supernatural things happen. They were a team. It's one of our core values. Everything's better in teams takes all of us. There is a, an alarming tendency in the largest of churches to think, well, we've got all kinds of staff members. We pay people to do that. Not here. We are intentionally understaffed so that we'll never develop that sorry attitude. Uh, we have fewer pastors per person than any other church our size, I, I know. It's better. Not, not only is ministry better in teams, it's more fun and it's more effective. It's all of us working together, using our gifts and talents, finding our place to serve God. In 2017, 662 new people found their place in ministry. 662. That's pretty awesome. And I know what you're thinking, 662, that means I can take a break or they don't need me. Yeah, there's still room for you. There's still need for you. God wants to use you in his supernatural plan. And as a result of your ministry, people will be set free and people will find hope in Jesus. Verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. This church had a wonderful sense of unity. So much so that they shared everything they had. A healthy church is unified, and God will use a unified church in a powerful way. I thank God and our leadership for the wonderful spirit of unity that we enjoy. I want that to continue. I pray for that. I, I pray for you. I pray that we will resist the forces that try to divide us and we'll, we will be united under what matters most, the lordship of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross that changes our lives. At some point, you're likely going to get your feelings hurt in church because there are people here. And there are people who are at all stages of the journey and it's likely at some point you will hurt someone else's feelings. Conflict is inevitable, and so the key is how we deal with it. And one of the keys is our core value. We resolve conflict biblically. What's the biblical way? Jesus taught that you go to the person you have the problem with, and them alone, and talk to them in an attitude of love and forgiveness. Gossip and unresolved conflict has no place in God's church. Church is so, supposed to be a safe place. So I commit to you, I will confront those who aren't willing to resolve conflict biblically. I won't allow them to be in leadership. If they're not willing to change, I will ask them to step down. As a leadership team, we are absolutely committed to being unified with each other and leading a unified church. We will have the difficult conversations in an attitude of love. So let me just tell you, if I ever have a problem with you, I will talk to you. 
if I haven't talked to you, I don't have a problem with you. Doesn't matter what anyone else says. Doesn't matter what you might feel. I don't have a problem with you because I'm going to handle it biblically. Uh, and here's the challenge. As our church grows, I don't hear everything. I don't hear a lot of things. I don't hear most things. So we all have to be committed to confronting unhealthy, dysfunctional habits and conversations that are sinful and harmful to God's church. So I want to give you a quick instruction on how you confront that. Number one, refuse to listen. Refuse to be a listening ear to gossiping, griping complainers that want to talk to you about others instead of going to the person that they're talking about. If no one will listen, gossips who refuse to obey God's command and repent will either shut up or go somewhere else. Either eventuality is fine with me. Don't listen. Secondly, kindly confront. When someone starts to talk to you about Brian, stop him and say, now, have you talked to Brian about that? I'm sure you intend to, so I'll just let you go ahead and do that instead of talking to me. I love you, but if I listen to you, I'm participating in your sin, and I'm risking God's judgment, and I respect God too much to listen to you. You say, Pastor Rod, if I say that, they'll get mad at me. They might, but you won't have to listen anymore. <laughs> I've learned over the years, most of the people who come and complain to me about gossip are themselves guilty. Now, I want to caution you. One other caution. Resolving conflict biblically doesn't always mean you get your way, that you win. Often, healthy biblical conflict resolution starts with you admitting that you're wrong. And don't assume that because you don't hear about a conversation, that doesn't happen. Someone says, well, Jackson did that, and you didn't confront him. Well, you assume that because we didn't report back to you that the conversation took place. It's interesting to me. You want to be corrected in private, but you want other people to be corrected in public. So we'll have the conversations in a healthy, safe way, and we will honor the confidentiality of difficult discussions. I have had people angry at me for years because I didn't confront someone that, in fact, I did confront. I just never reported it to them because it wasn't their business. And I don't plan to report it to you. Verse 45, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Healthy church, number seven, is generous. Made up of generous individuals. Generosity is not about what or how much you have. I mean, I know you've all been watching the, the Powerball and the Mega Millions this week, and you've been thinking, man, if I win that, we're going to build a new church and go with that thought. And I know God wants you to win, so <laughs> don't you dare go spend money because I said that. Generosity is not about if I get a whole lot of money, then I'll give. Generosity is about what you do with what you have. And you're awesome at this. You're generous with your money and your time and your attention and your love. Uh, last year, you see, you see it on the front of your bulletin, last year you gave over $2.7 million to missions. And you know, sometimes people look at that and say, well, you must have somebody who gives half a million dollars. That'd be awesome, but we don't. You must have somebody who gives huge amounts of money. We don't. It's just everybody committed to generosity and doing their part. Healthy Church, number eight, is committed. They didn't just meet together once a week. They met together every day. One of the commitments our new members make is to regular faithful attendance. And inevitably, somebody will ask, well, what does that mean? And I just always say, you don't want to ask me. Because when I grew up, you didn't miss church. My dad had a rule. If you're too sick for church, you're too sick for t TV, you're even too sick for the comics. You lay in bed and you pray that God heals you or God takes you home. <laughs> so we didn't miss church very much. I haven't missed a Sunday morning because of sickness in more than 20 years. See, you don't want me defining regular and faithful. I called my mom and dad last, last week, last Saturday night. They're old. They're 80. I, they're watching. When I say old, I mean <laughs> relative to you're, you're really not that old. 80's, 80's the new 50. 
And, you know, last week it was like, it was really cold. And I said, uh, you guys going to church tomorrow? It was quiet a second. My mom said, what are you talking about? I said, well, are you going to church? She said, well, yes, we're going to church. Why wouldn't we go to church? I said, well, it's going to be really cold. She said, do you think now that we're old, the cold keeps us away from church? I mean, my mom rebuked me. <laughs> know this. If you ask, why don't we ever, very first thing I'm going to do is ask about your attendance. Because chances are we do that. That happened. I've talked about that. You just missed that service or you don't attend that service at all. Makes me tired when people say, well, I want to go deeper. Why don't we go deeper? And then I start asking, so do you attend a connection class, a Bible study? Are you in a growth group? Do you come on Sunday nights? Well, no. So they want to go deeper but not commit any more time. That's not really the profile of someone who wants to go deeper. That's the profile of someone who wants to complain about the fact that we don't go deep enough for them when they're not willing to go deep anyway. Attending church is important for your spiritual growth and development. I don't expect everyone to attend all 20 services. That'd be crazy. But I think you should attend a main service for spiritual growth and be involved in at least one other connection point to build relationships. Verse 46 they followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal, a celebration, exuberant and joyful. When a healthy church gets together, it's supposed to be a celebration. I really like this part. A healthy church is fun. Church is not supposed to be boring. It's okay to have fun at church. It's okay to laugh at church. It's not only okay, it's biblical and it's healthy. If you're against fun... You're going to be miserable here because we're going to have fun. Tomorrow night, we're going to watch the best of video and we're going to laugh at all the stupid things I did in 2017. And I'm going to laugh with you. It's going to be fun. Verse 47, praising God. Healthy church is a worshiping church. Worshiping God with passion and enthusiasm. The Bible tells us that God enjoys our worship so much so that he inhabits the praises of his people. God's presence is attracted to our worship. I want to be a, an enthusiastic worship, worshiper. I want to be more passionate, more excited, more visibly in love with Jesus than ever before. This is, this is the part of a healthy church that I've just been praying and praying about for our church family. As I walk through our sanctuary, I've been praying, Lord, give us those moments in worship where we're just suddenly we know we're in the awesome presence of a holy God. Lord, interrupt our agenda with your presence. Give us, give us moments or waves of your glory sweep across this place. Let's walk in the door expectant and hungry and ready for something to happen. And Lord, I'll, I'll let it start with me. I'm going to worship you with more passion than I ever have. Next Sunday night. We'll, we'll connect with God, spend the night in worship. And I'm praying there's just an incredible sense of his presence as we do. And then verse 47. Enjoying the favor of, see that word there? All the people. Healthy church is influential. This church was relating to the same people who had killed Jesus. But now the church had the favor of all. Why? Why? Because they were loving, caring, unified, and healthy. And as a result of all that, they were impacting their community. There's something wrong with the church that doesn't influence its community. That's not healthy. Now, the result of all that unity, health, learning, loving, praying, giving, commitment, fun, worship, and influence, the greatest miracle of all, people were coming to Jesus every single day. A healthy church is outward focused. The Bible says the Lord added to their number daily. If we do the other 11 things and we aren't outward focused, we miss it. It's the easiest temptation. It's the quickest way for a church to die. When we start caring about ourselves, our needs, our desires, our preferences, more than we do reaching people who don't know Jesus. If church is just the way you want it, then everyone who attends church will be just like you. 
your age, your stage of life, your color, your race. That's the kind of church that lasts one generation and then dies. I want to attend church with people who are different than me. I want us to do music I don't like because I need to learn to like it. I want to build and lead and attend a church where my children and glory to God in only about seven weeks, my grandchildren can be challenged to grow and be lifelong followers of Jesus. If I have to choose, I'd rather be at a church designed for them than a church designed for me. I'm an adult. I know what it means to serve Jesus. At this stage of life, my focus changes. My focus is on the generations behind me, not me. I refuse to be a selfish church consumer. People sacrifice for me, and now it's my honor to sacrifice for them. I, I want to do life with people from different countries and backgrounds and life situations. I want to be friends with people who are old and young and, and everywhere in between. God's church must be a diverse church because we are headed to a diverse heaven. I want to be a part of God's church, the whole church. I want to see people from all walks of life experience the life-changing grace of Jesus. I want to celebrate with them as they discover his plan and purpose for their lives. The mission of the church is to reach people with the love of God. We will not be shaken from our core value and our commitment to it influencing everything we do. This is the essence of the gospel, our guiding principle. Every soul matters to God. If every soul matters to God, then if you claim to follow Jesus, every soul has to matter to you. You matter to God. And because you matter to God, you matter to us. He loves you, and so we love you. The biggest threat to this core value is prejudice. We cannot and we will not tolerate prejudice because prejudice devalues a soul for whom Christ died. Prejudice decides only souls like me qualify for the love of Jesus. Prejudice is an ugly, bitter sin that hurts the heart of God. To which you say, you don't understand, Pastor Rod, because you didn't grow up in the South. I have a story. I have history. There's a reason why I'm prejudiced. You're right. I don't understand. I don't understand why you would allow a hurt in your past to ruin your present and seriously affect your future. I don't understand how you would risk heaven over a hurt that's long ago. It's time to release that and to let it go and to love everyone Jesus loves. Every soul matters to God. You say, well, I just don't know about diversity. Diversity made a place for you. Let me just remind you that the gospel didn't start in America with white people. Hello? Thank God for diversity, because we're part of it. Why do we put so much emphasis on missions? Because every soul matters to God. An inward-focused church is an ugly thing. People worried more about sitting where they want, hearing the style of music they want, keeping other people from using their stuff, protecting their pitcher or their tablecloth. Worried about that more than they are about people dying and going to hell without Jesus. And we will fight that tendency by continuing to reach out to others here in central Arkansas and around the world. We will not turn inward, only caring about our needs our desires, our wants, our preferences. If we ever get there, we need to shut the door. We want to start 2018 by strategically giving to others and believing that as we do, God will use what we give to advance the kingdom and God will take care of our needs. One of my early mentors taught me if we take care of what's on God's heart, God takes care of what's on our heart. We have a lot of needs. We have a lot of things we need to do right here. Right now, there's so many things in our building that I want to do that, that are going to just move us forward. But we can't start with us. We must start with others. And so I want to share with you today an opportunity to make a difference with a group of people that need to hear.
about Jesus. Watch. Across Africa today, we have an incredible opportunity that's before us. There are 867 distinct unreached peoples that remain on the continent. These are people groups that have never received the gospel. They have no viable communities of faith that are in their midst. They have no one to tell them a meaningful witness of Jesus. And yet, we have 15,000 students ready to go in our Bible schools to penetrate the darkness, to take the gospel to these 867 unreached peoples. The problem is that most of these 15,000 have never received in their hands one textbook that will prepare them for ministry, that allows them to have the Bible in their own language. The answer to this is, for you and I to partner together and provide them a Kindle, which is a game changer. In this backpack of sorts, we're able to put the Bibles they need in their own language, ready reference materials, theological textbooks, and ministry preparation materials that allow them to have the confidence to fulfill the call of God in their life and take the hope of the gospel to these remaining 867 unreached peoples. Imagine with me being a pastor who feels called by God to fulfill the ministry and take the hope of the gospel to a people group, but I've never had access one time to one textbook. And we can put the game changer in their hands to put all the materials that they will ever need for them to be able to take the hope of the gospel and to fulfill the call of God on their lives and have an impact in Africa. dollars buys prepares and ships a Kindle for a pastor in Africa training to reach an unreached people group that Kindle would be loaded with the Bible in their own language textbooks for 38 classes wouldn't it be awesome if you could get all your college textbooks for a hundred bucks wouldn't it be awesome if you could get one of your college textbooks for a hundred bucks Seven years of discipleship resources. And here's the great thing. Over 900 study resources. They get almost a thousand books loaded on the Kindle for your $100. We have 15,000 students in 352 Bible schools preparing to reach 867 unreached people groups. They just need the materials to do it. And here's what I want to ask you to do. I just want to ask everybody to give 100 bucks, Buy one Kindle for a pastor in Africa. And you say, well, Pastor Rod, I can't afford 100. Well, can you afford 20? And every five people that do that will buy one. And guess what? There will be somebody else who's going to come along and give 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 to provide. And together, we are going to, we are going to meet the need. And we're going to give pastors what they desperately need. We're going to reach out, and as a result of your giving, pastors will be trained and people will come to Jesus. Our ushers are coming. Uh, if you're using text to give, the keyword is simply Kindles, K-I-N-D-L-E-S. You can give, you can put a check, you can put cash in, you can text to give, you can use the app, you can write your credit card information or go to the kiosk after service and put it in. But together, let's make a difference. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for pastors, students who are training to be pastors, to go into some of the most difficult places in the world among people who've never heard the gospel. Lord, their incredible commitment to share your love. They're doing, they're sacrificing so much, Lord, and it seems like what we do in response is so little. But thank you for our partnership in the gospel that you can give what you can use what we give to partner with them to make a difference. And Lord, we dare to believe that whole people groups will learn about you and respond to your love because of our giving, because of pastors who will be trained. I pray your blessing for every person, every individual. 
the gifts to share what they have so others can hear your love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.